You want to know what's happening on the big board? I'll tell you what's happening on the big board. Kevin, CEO, big man, is counting down his top 10 games of 2018. I don't care. Hey, welcome to the big board. So today, uh, I thought we would do something fun. It is March and it's a little late, but I thought it might be fun to take a look back at 2018, have a look at some of the games we played, have a look at the eight or 10 favorite games of mine that I enjoyed playing, look at two or three bad games, and then look at some of the uh, uh, the games that were fairly innovative that I, that I thought that I enjoyed. Uh, now, somewhere along the line, I decided to call that the good, the bad, and the ugly. Really, it's not the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's all good. We'll just see what happens, okay? So bear with me. We're going to run through these titles. I know the camera may not uh, look awesome, but uh, it's going to get better because we're going to switch cameras in just a minute once we, once we kind of run through things. So without further ado, let's have a look. Ten. Ten. Ten! That's right. The Korean War. Fantastic fun. Let's have a look at it and talk a little bit more about what I enjoyed about my very brief experience with this game. All right. So the first thing, first game we want to talk about in our uh, top 10 was uh, the Korean War. I only got to play uh, a little bit of this game, just a, a couple of turns, but was struck by how uh, very, very interesting the game was. Despite its age, it has uh, worn well, as they say, uh, perhaps not as absolutely historical as, uh, was historical, yeah, not, not as, as historical as some that are around, but it still plays incredibly well. And then of course, surprising, uh, unsurprisingly, I enjoyed it because it's a Joseph Belkowski game. Yet another epic title from him. Played real well, uh, both solitaire and opposed. We played this on on Vassal, so my, my copy is still actually unpunched. And got great satisfaction from seeing the very quick drive by the North Vietnamese and then having that all go to hell in a handbasket uh, very quickly as the US forces start to arrive. Uh, so it's got that wonderful ebb and flow. It's beautifully done. I think this is unpunched. I'm not even sure here. Still unpunched here. So at some point I am gonna get this back on the table and we'll do a full campaign uh, by myself, we'll do this solo. Uh, so, uh, a great, a great title that clocked in at uh, number ten, as uh, as already stated. I swear to God, I really don't want to do this. Nine. Now, this game actually turns up in its uh, appropriate slot. And one other slot as well. And we'll, uh, we'll have some fun having a look at this one as well. Now, I am going to talk about this in a different section of the video. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here. But I am just going to show you some of the components very quickly. So you can get a look, a look and feel for it. And then what you can do is if you listen in at the innovative section at the end of the game, uh, at the end of this video, I should say, you will be able to see and hear a little bit more about uh, what I thought of the game and why I thought what I thought. And why can't I, you know, I'm trying to get to the city section of the map. Here you go here. Uh, some real nice graphic art uh, done here. It's very, very thematic. There's a full mounted map that cam comes with the game as well. Uh, it's got some car driven activities that uh, occur and there are multiple sets of stickers that you can choose to use either the designer versions or the icon stickers as the case may be depending on your uh, desire only 10 pages or 12 pages of rules something along that nature and a uh, a very smart ai that you will hear more about in a little while so that clocked in and it's appropriate spot there number nine
obviously it's eight. I mean, if Kevin didn't screw it all up, we're at eight. Huh? Indeed. Flat top, a fantastic experience playing with uh, a group of guys, both of us, uh, both sides plotting their moves and really digging into the, the meat of the system. Now you might find it curious that a game from 1981 is in my top 10 for 2018. <laughs> but oh, we played this opposed and it was an amazing experience. It's a beautiful, large amount of map. It has a very thematic set of gameplay. It is unfortunately, of course, all hidden gameplay. Uh, you can see my my copies my copies pretty well hacked up and done and dusted, but uh, it's a significant w amount of work that goes into playing this game. It is well worth it. It's probably not the most one hundred again one hundred percent you know accurate in terms of OB and uh, mechanics and things like that, but it's very thematic and it and it all kind of comes together and works very well. So I really enjoyed playing having the opportunity to play this opposed. Because I've only ever played it uh, solo in the past. And of course, probably one of the most uh, iconic Roger McGowan uh, covers ever. Coming back from his heyday. Seven. Seven. I want to go play my game. Seven. Yep. This one has uh, proved its worth uh, in the second, oh, this is the, actually the third volume uh, by Sean Chick and published by Hollenspiel. Designed by Sean Chick. You're gonna have to have the base module for this and it's expensive, but it's well worth it. If you like, for instance, Command & Colors Ancients or Command & Colors Napoleonics or any of those Borg-esque games, this is <clears throat> a Hex Encounter version of that uh, except you're not using cards. It's not a card-driven system, right? And this this module deals specifically with the Seven Years' War, and there are uh, there's other modules out as well. Of course, this is module three. I would uh, highly encourage you to try it. It's kind of the thinking man's command of colors is how I look at it, and it's got a great theme coming at it out of it. Lots of interesting scenarios. Let's pull this out here. So as you can see here, we've got Zorndorf and Bergen and Montmorency and Minden and Torgau and Colin and Lobositz and all the rest of it. So uh, some uh, updates to the core rules in here as well. And then uh, one of the things that I like most about this game is that it really does dig in and focus on uh, each individual nation's uh, particular capabilities. And there are a little little special special uh, capabilities for nearly all the different forces. The you know, you gotta be real stupid to have agreed to do something like this. Counting down top ten. I mean, really. What's he gonna have me do next? You know, turn cards or panels like Vanna White? Six. Now I know what you're saying. How can that possibly be uh, a game from 2018 when it was made in 2019. The box is too big for me to hold up and manage uh, the keyboard and the mouse and everything else as well. So this is a, an expansion for OST, Old School Tactical, on the Western Front. I'm not sure how to even uh, go about showing all of this. You've seen lots of my write-ups probably about my gameplay with the OST system. Suffice to say, lots of cool scenarios, lots of big one-inch counters, massive boards with large hex hexes, great artwork, the revisions to the rules, I forget what version we're on now, but uh, make it a, a much cleaner, faster playing game and uh, makes art, artillery, makes tanks uh, highly, uh, not highly, make the, makes tanks far more interesting. Uh, before it was very difficult to kill tanks. Uh, tank on tank battle often ended up being a, a case of damaging each other multiple times and uh, not ending up with a kill. Uh, that's now been fixed.
this is the main box and the box I showed you, the airborne box came with the Kickstarter. So two big boxes and you can see the size uh, compared to a normal, uh, normal scale box, which I don't have handy, uh, significantly larger, lots of counters, lots of scenarios and uh, some innovative gameplay mechanics. It's not like lock and load. It's not like ASL. It's not like Band of Brothers. It is its own beast. It does have obviously uh, many things in common with a lot of those games, but at its core, it's a tactical system that relies on activation points that are generated uh, via die rolling. And then the, the gameplay mechanics from there are, are more or less similar to many other games, but there are some unique features as you dig into an, un, un, one of these games, as you unpack it and start playing, you'll see that you'll need slightly different tactics to be successful as one side or the other versus just your your typical ASL approach or lock and load approach or Band of Brothers approach or Combat Commander approach or whoever else is the, the latest guy on the, excuse me, the latest guy on the block, right? So there you go. Uh, old School Tactical, uh, Western Front 1944-45. It's a Mark Walker game, but uh, designed by Shane Logan from Flying Pigs. All the best. You were probably wondering when a GMT game would hit the top 10 list and at what position, and here it is. An older game, right? We'll get into this and have a conversation about it. Well, it wouldn't be a top uh, top 10 without a bird game, right? And uh, <clears throat> this, this particular game, I've had it for quite a while, had not played it, played Carthage a lot, obviously. It's the Ancient Worlds series. It is a... Fairly robust system, but very straightforward. In the end of the day, really what we're doing here is chip pull. And uh, chip pull by, uh, by, uh, by leader. Uh, each uh, leader gets a certain number of activations depending on the number of uh, the caliber of his uh, leadership rating. You've got uh, forces you've got to raise, uh, legions you've got to raise, senators get their chance to be... Uh, uh, console and all that sort of fun stuff and you've got to go and uh, uh, conquer the Samnites and all that sort of good old bits and pieces. There's lots of charts in here but it's not that hard a game. Combat is pretty straightforward. Movement is pretty interesting because you've got this this friction that goes on, this attrition that occurs over time uh, in, a, in, a, in a given activation. Uh, the further you move, the more attrition you suffer. And if you don't control the area, then you pay a higher, a higher uh, attrition rate than you would if you did control the area, things of that nature. Very interesting games. I loved this and had a great fun. Uh, played just the one scenario out of it, but really enjoyed it almost as much as I enjoyed uh, playing Carthage. So fun times with that one. Four, 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 four. Back-to-back -back GMT titles in the top 10. Not bad, huh? Let's have a look. So I'm going to try and not gush over this thing. Um, I've only got one and a half plays in of this and it is fantastic it has its bones deeply rooted in the third world war mechanics uh, in terms of efficiency ratings and the way movement works and the way combat works and things of that nature and then it has an entire set of layers for the air war and SAMs and special forces and uh, ballistic missiles and navies and you name it, it's in there. And it does it all very, very, very well. Uh, probably one of the most clear rule books I've come across in a long time. Uh, it's almost like you're reading a Frank Chadwick book, uh, rule book. Uh, beautifully done, great artwork. Uh, I guess I can show you some of it in here. That's kind of, and this also has area area movement, uh, as well as 
just the regular hexing counter movement. Uh, and there's good reasons for, for dealing with the Estonia you know, Peninsula, this area, Lithuania and whatnot uh, in such a, a fashion. That's uh, all well explained there. But uh, then you've got the full, the full map. Lots of counters, lots of uh, lots of Soviet forces, etc., special forces, and all that sort of good stuff. Excellent game. Can't speak more highly of it, and I'm looking forward to the next volumes as they uh, as they arise. Three. I'm really getting tired of this. Hey, Chantal, isn't this fun? Doing this for Kevin? Hey, isn't it fun? I don't want to be there. Three. Stop Neither. it. I don't want to be there either. Now, it was difficult for me to choose the uh, number three slot, and it was probably always going to be a multi-man publishing title, and it was always probably going to be uh, a TCS title with the OCS coming in a close second. I played quite a bit of OCS online, opposed, uh, this last year. But uh, I also played Canadian Crucible, uh, Opposed, and Solo, and enjoyed both of them very much. Let's have a little bit more of a look at this. Canadian Crucible, you know, I get, uh, I, I get the sense that there are a lot of folks, uh, all the TCS fans and some of the designers and developers that really get their knickers in a twist when I complain about uh, the TCS system. And it's funny because what I'm complaining about is the fact that they're not really making a lot more of these games or don't appear to be investing in the system, uh, arguably because it doesn't sell well. And so they think that, that it's a pricing problem. And so they're getting rid of the boxes and sell them, sell them the, the next one that comes out after this in a Ziploc bag. You know, I don't want to pay $40, $45 for a Ziploc bag game. Whatever the price point is, not sure I want to pay it unless it's 30 or less. I want a boxed game like this with beautiful artwork and the series rules. I'd like to see this series rule book in color, please. Instead of us having to go and make our own our own charts and color color tables as the fans have done. Beautiful artwork on the map. Look at that. Great counter, great counters. Interesting topic extremely well researched and very historically accurate uh it all plays so well it just frustrates the hell out of me that there's not more of these games being made at a faster rate in a box and i am not going to be supporting this system any further uh i will play the ones i own and that will be it uh anything that comes out in a ziploc bag Unless I pick it up cheap for thirty dollars or less, it won't be it won't be purchased by me. But in the meantime, you can thoroughly enjoy Canadian Crucible. Uh, this was a fantastic system for me this year. I played a couple of different modules and the played this opposed and then played it solo and had an absolute blast with this thing. So it's very, very entertaining gameplay and uh, a, a fantastic system. It is not as hard as it looks and the orders system makes it a great solitaire game system for you to invest in. Highly recommended. Two, dos, due, du, zwei, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Europeans have done really well in my 2018 uh, gameplays and in the rankings, as you can tell. So, most of you know how to pronounce this correctly, and I may not. So we're going to leave it at that. I'll let you read the title, and we'll let's have a let's have a look. All right, here we go. Look at that box artwork. That tells you you're in for a treat, right? Yeah, I've got to pull out uh, my other Kalakajimas in there as well. I only got to play the Battle of Sek Sekigahara. Uh, I think I don't know if we played it twice. I think it maybe it was just the one time. We talked about playing it a second time, and we talked about what we would do. <laughs> I think, uh, well, maybe I did play it twice. I don't know. But anyway, gorgeous maps, right? Let me just let the camera focus for you. Gorgeous maps, fantastic artwork on the counters, which I'll show you in just a second. Uh, great gameplay. Highly explanatory charts, 
Very well done, CRT. Beautiful rule book. I loved playing this. We had a absolute blast. Now I don't think my I don't think we used mine to play. We used my buddies. Well, maybe we did. Well, I don't know where all the counters are, but you can see you can see the exact representative counters from. Uh, actually, yeah, you can see these here. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit. There you go. They're pretty thematic uh, counters. And these ones here have all the mons, all the mons from the various uh, different clans. I thought that was pretty cool as well. Excellent game. That's why it, uh, it it hit all the buttons for me in terms of what what a great war game should be, and uh, that's why it's ranked where it is. Yay! One. Thank you very much. I can't wait till we meet Kevin so I can beat the crap out of you. That's right. A third European uh, designed, developed, and manufactured title. Austerlitz 1805 from the Rising Eagles system or Eagles of France system. And it's a Hexasim title, so Hexasim uh, take out the number two and number one slot. And here we go. The last one in our top 10. Austerlitz 1805, Eagles of France system. This is called Rising Eagles from Hexasim. So two titles from Hexasim and number one, number two slot. This, uh, this was truly a, also a great experience from counters to maps. You notice there's no, no hex numbers on these, right? Fantastic. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Loved the victory conditions. Loved the uh, <clears throat> loved the gameplay. Loved the use of uh, hidden cores. Uh, so each each core receives three chits that are placed on the map, and they've got to stay within a certain range of each other. But uh, so the enemy doesn't know really which is the real core, right? Uh, this is dealing with the fog at Austerlitz, so that made it uh, particularly challenging. And as the range, as the visibility range increases, you know, it makes it a little bit easier to find find the bad guys. But uh, it adds such a level of suspense to an already fantastic uh, battle and uh, battle system that uh, it's pretty hard to uh, pretty hard to walk away from going. Uh, no, I didn't enjoy that. You you will have a great time with this game. I like the level of detail that's provided here. A lot of folks saying at this uh, sort of tactical level, uh, we should, or grand tactical level, that we should be having uh, more detail in terms of melee, cavalry charges, unit facing, and things of that nature. I think this game system and the way orders are done, another fascinating uh, aspect of this game, uh, the way orders are done and, and and whatnot really drives the Napoleonic flavor and puts you in the commander's seat, the overall army commander's seat. What are going to be your tactics? What are, going, what are going to be your strategies? How are you going to be successful? Where can you get to? What happens if you want to change your, your orders? What's your enemy doing? All those sorts of things play into making this a, a very, very consumable and very, very approachable war game system uh, for Napoleonics. It's really well done. All right, so that was the good news. That was all the, the fun stuff. If you don't want to see any more, if you don't want to hear about what I thought was uh, ugly or bad, we can uh, stop right here. Or you could stay and listen. Let me, uh, let me explain why three games in particular felt uh, like they could have been done better uh, or, or uh, developed more or uh, been a little bit more thoughtful about their approach. And then after that, let's have a look at three or four very innovative titles that I think really deserve a lot more credit than perhaps they have received. So first off, let's talk about these three titles. And let's start with uh, 
the, 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 the number three baddest one for me. Three. I'm really good at that. Was, uh, what if 1938? Now, recently I had, uh, in 2017, I had played, I think it was 1937 What If or 1938 What If Poland or something like that. And uh, it was a magazine game coming out of the uh, Compass uh, Paper Wars. Is it Compass? Maybe it is, yeah. Compass uh, Paper Wars magazine and a Thai bomber game. And you've probably seen, if you follow any of the sort of social media stuff on Facebook occasionally, I'll sort of have a few comments about uh, some of Thai Bomber's uh, newer designs. And and it's not just me. Uh, there's a lot of folks that have uh, commented on the, uh, the uh, generic nature of the designs, the maps, the counters, and, and in some cases, the folks that have actually played the games uh, are also uh, disappointed with the gameplay, the virtual conditions, whether or not there are zones of control, uh, some of the OB, and a wide variety of other things. And the harsh reality, unfortunately, for 1938 What If, is while it's, it's actually one of the more interesting games in the What If se sequence that I think goes from 1938 all the way to 52 or something like that, uh, is it's the same set of rules uh, and the same, almost the same victory conditions and the same abstracted level of play that I've played half a dozen other times from way back in the old Command days, Command Magazine days. So I, I, struggled, I struggled with the game uh, art-wise. I struggled with the, the uh, inaccuracies in the map and there were cities in the wrong spot. Uh, the rules had the cities in the wrong spot uh, by hex number. And there were, uh, you know, there was just this level of abstraction that made it kind of silly. And it felt like it had been given a cursory overview in testing and pushed out the door. And, and I understand that uh, there are some folks that do this for a living and it's their only source of income. Uh, that and maybe writing or whatever the case may be. And don't get me wrong, I love Ty Bomber's uh, magazine write-ups he does for these quarterlies that uh, come out from s and magazine. I think they're fantastic. The Stalingrad uh, edition was fantastic. Uh, wonderful maps in that, really, really well done. But the games, I think, where he's uh, not able to sell two or three thousand copies at a time, he's trying to make it up in volume by selling two hundred copies of the same, basically the same system with a different map and slightly different counters, and, and it just got frustrating after a while because uh, I keep trying to, to find a gem out of these and go, oh, this is the one, this is the Thai Bomber game you need to get and play. And I just think it feels lazy. And there's certainly, that's certainly not a criticism of his diligence in his work effort because he puts a lot of games out, so there's a lot of work being done. But it's a criticism of the, the lack of uh, perhaps thoughtfulness or uh, creativity that goes into uh, his games. His games, there are two game systems he uses and they apply equally to pretty much any situation. And I'm done with them. So there will be no more type of games coming into this house until I hear from somebody else who tells me it's awesome. All right, so what was the- Two. Yeah, uh, what was the second uh, most uh, Difficult game for me to play this this last year. Uh, Proud Monster Deluxe. Three times we set this thing up uh, on Vassal. Three times we got started. Twice we had to restart, and then after the third time, we just said, "You know what? We're done. Uh, we were done with the uh, inconsistencies with the rules. We were done with the the little." clever, tricky little rules that uh, require 10 plays to get them right and find all the Easter eggs. Uh, you know, if you're going to play a game that spans two or three maps and has several hundred counters on it, you don't get tricky little nuancey bullshit rules like uh, you can attack an empty hex, right? So that you can advance and get across the river uh, so the next turn you don't have to pay the movement cost, cost to get across the river and oh by the way that's the only way you're going to get to Moscow 
we had several of those types of examples of the, in the rules that were uh, for me and for my gameplay partner relatively relatively problematic to the extent that after three efforts uh, we just decided to give up on it and that was really disappointing because I think there's a solid game there and uh, I, I also don't know that uh, well I will leave We'll leave Don's uh, peccadillos out of it, but uh, we'll, we'll, I, I'm not sure the designer wants to hear criticism or commentary. Uh, he'll listen, but you know, won't take any action necessarily. Although he did, uh, he did make one smart ass rule change uh, uh, to uh, help me uh, be, because of the way the odds table works. Anyway, uh, so the final, the third game that yay. One. I played last year that was early in the year and quite frankly I don't remember a lot about it but I, I believe I you can find a, a video online about it uh, but it was the Millennium Wars Lebanon scenarios out of one of the magazines I think it was in either Paper War, Wars or Counterfact or whatever it was uh, and in fact you know I think uh, the 1938 What If was in Counterfact magazine now that I think about it but uh, terrible terrible rules and, and horribly organized and difficult to understand and it didn't make sense there were things that you could do that were bizarre and I don't understand where this system came from or how it got to be the way it is uh, there's other modules out I thought that this was a, a full and complete module that I could play and get a taste for the system and then go buy all the rest of it because the concepts are really interesting. These rounds of activity that occur based on your capability and basically your initiative, right? Your quality. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting and there are certainly a, a wide range of different uh, activities that you can execute and conduct as a, as a, a different, you know, by different unit types. And on the back of each counter, there are a set of icons for all the different activities you can conduct. But all these, and all these activities are jammed in this tiny little table with, with, with small fonts and almost unreadable dense text that explain how you go about doing activity X versus activity Y. And there's this, you know, these little icons that, that uh, represent that on the counter. And you gotta go dig it up and look at, it, look at it in the rule book. And it made it really, really challenging to actually get, uh, get a lot of value or clarity out of that game and the map was probably one of the most atrocious looking maps I've ever seen anyway. So that hit my top number one most disliked game for the year. Let's have a look at now three very innovative titles, uh, in fact four very innovative titles that I think uh, would serve you well if you were able to track them down and buy them this, this year in 2019. You want to know what's happening on the big board? I'll tell you what's happening on the big board. Kevin, CEO, big man, is counting. Ooh, all right. So the first is Heroes of Normandy, The Untold Stories. And you might say, well, hey, Kevin, that's just an expansion for Lock and Load, Heroes of Normandy. Why would, uh, why would anybody care about that? It's just going to be more scenarios and, uh, you know, some extra special rules and bits and pieces like that. Well, you're absolutely right. That's what it is. Uh, but it's more than that because this, this expansion uh, comes with uh, a book on Audible, if you want. You want to listen to four stories. Uh, well, actually, it's more than four stories. It's 12 stories, I believe. Let me just see how many are in here, and I'll tell you. Two, four, six, eight, nine. Nine stories uh, that you can listen to, or you can purchase the Kindle, you know, whatever digital book version, or you can actually buy the paperback version of the book and, uh, and have a read or a listen, and then go play the scenarios and play as Mac, as one of the, the Scottish characters who are uh, just in the are in the airborne that have landed and they're trying to take the farmhouse, you can go play that scenario. What a great idea! What a great way to deepen and enrich the narrative experience uh, in the in gameplay. Uh, I think that was probably a very uh, 
It may, it's probably done before. I, I, I don't know if it has. I, you know, Team Yankee is the first thing that comes to mind, but I think Team Yankee was written and then a game was made up after it. This was all purpose built and put together in this fashion, and I think that's great. Uh, <coughs> combined with that, of course, there was a follow a follow on expansion uh, called uh, We Stand Alone Battles of Easy Company, which is obviously about the uh, paratroopers. But uh, I thought those were a very interesting uh, take on. Uh, bringing something different to the table for Wii Gamers. The, uh, the next thing that uh, is on my list here, if I can pick up the box, is Optimatis and Popularis. So, fascinating, fascinating game here. Very uh, minimalist in its content. Excuse me, two display sheets, 88 counters, and a page rule book, gonna die. And, uh, it's really all about politics, and I'm not a big politics Euro gamer guy. And this is kind of a, a chip placement uh, game, I guess I would say. You're trying to build up your influence and power in the Senate while you keep the. Um, have I got that upside down? I do. Uh, while you. Yeah, I, I really should do marketing for a living. Uh, you, you, uh, you're trying to build up these tracks so that you can keep uh, your influence in in society with the merchants and with the populace and with the military as well so it's just got these simple uh, these simple little uh, tracks here that you've got to kind of keep populated and I'm looking for where is the uh, there's two tracks here we go so you've got to you know keep the legions happy keep the poor happy uh, keep the italic franchise in in play you uh, got to work at how you're going to deal with the agrarian reforms and debt relief and the grain doll so here's another chart hopefully that'll focus up uh, now you can buy upgraded versions of these now I think it's got either canvas maps or mounted versions or something of that nature and uh, it's a relatively fast playing game and it's a it's a really fun interesting game it's a yet another uh, uh, Tom Russell title that is uh, <clears throat> that's that's onion like in its uh, in its gameplay. The more you play it, the more you realize there are subtleties and layers to to the gameplay and the decisions that you get to make and the impact on those decisions. This is one of those titles where anything you do to have a positive effect in one aspect of the game is probably either A, going to give you a negative effect in some other aspect of the game or give your opponent an advantage. I hate those games. I hate those games. Great fun. Innovative, fun stuff. All right. Uh, Inferno is way down the bottom on the, on the stack here, so I'm not going to pull it out again and you already had a look at it. I'll just say that uh, Vento Nuovo games, at, just like Hollenspiel, while Hollenspiel is uh, certainly leveraging a lot of external designers and, and publishing at an amazing rate uh, because of its print-on-demand uh, business model. Uh, Vento Nuovo games is growing as well, but much more organically with just the one uh, designer developer working with a, a team of folks in Italy and, it's, and a small, uh, small crew of employees. And the Inferno title, for me, was a insight into how smart you can make an AI with very, very simple rules versus a lot of the overly complex and overwrought AI systems that we're seeing kind of popping up. And it's kind of like a, it's a mini trend going on in wargaming at the moment where every title comes out the first question out of anybody's mouth is does it have an AI I can't play it without an AI well I think you've been spoiled by some of these coin games that uh, you know this resource management euro style or war euro style games where you are uh, you are uh, playing against an AI, an AI which has just two or three or four different things it can do that's fine, right? But hex and counter games are not meant necessarily to be uh, bounded by an AI or, or, a, or a game assistance style system. 
there are a lot of difficulties and complexities and I think a lack of richness of gameplay that comes from, from that sort of stultified approach. Inferno has managed to crack the code on fixing that and making a very dynamic AI opponent cause all sorts of havoc for you and still feel authentic and real and somewhat Soviet-like in its, uh, its demeanor and behavior. And that really makes for a fascinating experience as a solo game. Not only that, uh, you know, that game, Inferno, can be played uh, opposed, cooperatively, and solo. And there are two levels of solo, and if, you, if you're if you stupid enough to try and play the hard designer level, God bless you, but don't expect to win, because it ain't going to happen, as far as I can tell, anyway. Uh, and I put five, six, seven plays into that thing, and uh, enjoyed it immensely. It's a race against the clock, and you uh, snooze, you lose, and you have to be prepared to be as bloodied as just about anything. It is not, though, a historical representation of, of Stalingrad. It's not going to give you the day by day and the moment by moment and the exact arrival and departure of various units. That's not going to happen. It is going to give you the flavor and the feel of the siege-like mentality that occurred and the dramatic choices that need to be made, perhaps, uh, during that campaign. So fascinating, fun, innovative, clever, gorgeous artwork, gorgeous components, beautiful box. I can't speak more highly or effusively about the components of that game. Uh, and the gameplay. Okay, so which brings me to my last innovator for 2018. Also, uh, you know, also a European uh, company, Thin Red Lines. Thin Red Line Games, 1985 Under an Iron Sky. This, uh, this uh, uh, Fabrizio uh, has built this company from scratch with his buddy in a, uh, in a uh, enthusiastic, passion-led desire to bring SBI titles back to life, and so he took, uh, you know, what in essence is Mark Herman's game, and he was the developer on it, uh, of The Next War, which is a uh, fundamentally uh, has some potential flaws in it, right? The gameplay is long and difficult, and the air war has its challenges, and the CRT has its challenges, and the naval game is just torturous. Uh, but it was on a topic at a, at a battalion and regimental scale that got everyone's attention and it was wildly popular for a long time. And this is uh, uh, Mr. Bettinelli's, uh, uh what's the right word? Is It's his, uh, his uh, way of honoring that but reinventing it and uh, giving it its uh, a fresh face, a fresh look uh, with a beautiful, uh, this is a piece of paper map, but uh, these, are, these are also paper maps, but they're very thick, beautiful, flexible uh, bits and pieces here. But giving it a, a, a more modern look and feel, I don't know if that's coming up all right, a new air war system, which, uh, a new AA system as well, which arguably is potentially just as challenging and difficult as the original, but in a different way. Uh, it's focused on uh, sectors on the map versus sectors across uh, overall, uh, and then a, a different resolution methodology as well. But uh, a noble effort here, and you know they get uh, points for uh, put, putting the putting the love into the uh, the design. The, the lots of counters here, obviously, I'm not going to get into too much detail on it. You can look at my videos. I played this uh, couple of scenarios out of this and did the Checkpoint Charlie scenario and kind of walked through that. And uh, I have not played the cam main campaign game yet. And I do ha still uh, actually do have some reservations about this system and the game overall as to whether or not it's going to uh, fix the sort of the the core problem I found with the next war, which was that if you're uh, if if you're NATO, really all you need to do if you can identify the main thrust of the advance for the Soviets, <coughs> all you got to do is line up those uh, those little battalions of uh, you know, 
dipsticky French and Belgian and British units and just line them up one after the other along the road or uh, around the area and make make the make the, the Soviets you know fight through all those guys and bump up their friction not their friction their fatigue level and maybe inflict a step loss on them because of the way the CRT works right uh, that was one to me that was the biggest issue with uh, both the CFS system and uh, and the next war system they had that uh, core fundamental problem I think that uh, you know artificially stacking battalions along a stretch of highway where there's forest on each side for instance uh, you, you, you can clog up three divisions there and nobody's going anywhere uh, that said I think this might be might have uh, that problem potentially as well and it, the air war may may be a little cluttered still and uh, it might uh, it might benefit from a revisit from some someone to uh, who's played the campaign once you've played the campaign a half a dozen times kind of work it out and see if there's a way to tweak that little sucker a bit I've had some thoughts on it haven't really shared them with anybody yet but I think things could be done in a, in a different manner and I was playing with another modern war game designer and uh, he kind of had uh, similar thoughts. In fact, gave gave me some ideas on how things could be tweaked. Lots of great charts in here. The count, like I said, the counter work is nice. I, I really think this is one of uh, 2018's best high-end productions. Only made 500 copies of this thing. Immediately had to go out and do another run of 500 or 250, I think. And uh, they're all sold out. It's unavailable. It's heavy. It's it's, it's expensive. It's a $200 game. So you you know you want it to be right. It's not a game. It's not a game kit in a box. It's a game and it works. But I think it has potential to be even better with uh, some uh, some experimental gameplay by uh, by you geniuses out there, right? All right, that's all I had for you. I know, it's, and I hope that uh, you found it interesting and fascinating. And we'll catch you soon. And I want to give a special thank you. Thank you very much. I can't wait till we meet Kevin. So let's give a special thank you to Dan Pelcaldi, my uh, erstwhile online friend who has his own blog channel, No Enemies Here. And you should check that out if you want the weekly uh, uh, dose of wargaming news, new titles that are out, what all the video bloggers are doing, his opinions on those, some of his own music will be played while uh, he's presenting that or as interludes or intermezzos as he likes to call them. And you can enjoy his uh, music, his creativity and his uh, video blog every week. It's out. You should try it sometime. Not only that, you can give him money and I think you should. For some reason, when you live in Canada and you want to try and have a game sent to you, apparently it's enormously expensive. So, and he likes to do these uh, overviews and box unboxings and things like that. He's a big shot on the Dice Towers or whatever that channel is called that all the Euro gamers uh, are on. So he, he's like a, a big deal over there too, not just in our little war gamer world. So go support him uh, on uh, Patreon or Patreon or whatever the hell it's called or throw him a shekel or whatever crumbs under the table, anything like that would be good. I'm sure you'll take it all. Any way you can get it, he'll take it. All right, peace, out. Thanks for watching.